Welcome, everyone. I'm Dr. John White, the Chief Medical Officer at WebMD, and you're watching Coronavirus in Context. Are we going to need boosters for sure? When are we going to see vaccination for kids under 12? And what is everyone talking about in terms of ivermectin? To help answer some of these questions, I've gone straight to the source. My guest today is Dr. Janet Woodcock. She's the Acting Commissioner of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Dr. Woodcock, thanks for joining me. It's nice to see you again. Great seeing you. Dr. Woodcock, let's start off with the biological licensing application for Pfizer. It's now fully approved, their vaccine, for people 16 years of age and older. You mentioned in a media conference call that this was a game changer, really a big deal. Why does full approval matter? Well, I think this is a milestone in our fight against COVID-19. Um, we have now a vaccine that's fully approved by the FDA. There are groups of uh, folks out there, polls have shown that uh, we're holding out, waiting for a full approval before they would get vaccinated. And we know the most important weapon we have against this virus and the way to control the pandemic is to get as many people vaccinated as possible. So this is yet one additional step uh, in, in making that fight be effective. What do you say to critics that say, what took so long? What, what, what's different? Because let's be honest, many people don't understand the FDA process. So what didn't the FDA have several months ago when they authorized the vaccine that they got to enable them to give full approval? Well, that's a great question, John, because so many other people are asking, how did it happen so fast? And the answer to both is this. Okay, when we did the emergency use authorization, the trial was still ongoing. We had uh, very good data on a large number of people, though. We knew the vaccine uh, was effective uh, based on the, its re reduction of cases uh, of, a, of the virus, and we had a good safety uh, information. But the trial was still ongoing. We didn't have a lot of long-term safety data, and we didn't have many of the other things that you have for uh, a full approval of a, of a biologic license application. That trial uh, gathered more data. We had more people vaccinated. We got more um, safety data, follow-up data. And we also got a tremendous amount of real-world evidence uh, from hundreds of millions of people being vaccinated. And CDC, FDA, and regulatory agencies around the world are watching the adverse events and, and monitoring uh, that administration. So all that information and including additional manufacturing information, additional inspections and so forth were done so that the vaccine approval met the full scientific standards that the FDA uh, has for all vaccine products. And um, so some people are saying they can't understand how it happened so fast. Other people are saying uh, they felt it took too long. But in fact, we work with all due speed. We made no shortcuts. Uh, we didn't cut any corners. Uh, we did everything according to our standards. However, it did take a while to get through hundreds of thousands of pages of data and make sure that all all those requirements were met. Let's talk about kids. 300 kids are hospitalized a day. That's not something that we saw even at the height of the pandemic. Everyone wants to know about where are we in terms of timing for vaccination for kids under 12. Previously, FDA officials had said that vaccination for kids under 12 would go to an advisory committee. Has there been any final decision made uh, about the role of the advisory committee in terms of reviewing the data for kids under 12? Well, I think whoever said that said it because it may be likely that we would need to have a public discussion with our advisors about children under 12. Um, I can't 
speak to when such um, a review might take place and be finalized. Obviously, we are going to move with all haste for the younger children when we uh, get applications and we will uh, get them uh, in the lives as quickly as possible. Yeah. But children raise additional questions. They're not small adults, as we've learned over the years. They have to be studied separately. They will need different dosage forms, lower doses, and they might have reactions and safety issues that could be different than adults. And so all these uh, questions are going to depend on the data and what is actually found in the trials. But as soon as we get that information from the companies, we will jump on it. I've been hearing from parents around the country every day how important it is to them to get their children vaccinated as soon as possible as they get back to school. Now, because Pfizer is fully licensed, there are some advocates who are saying that Pfizer should be used off-label for kids under 12. What's your message to those parents who are thinking that's a good idea, or those pediatricians, and there are some out there and, and they're saying it's legal to do so, that are considering vaccinating kids under 12 off-label? Yes, well, there are two separate kinds of considerations. Um, the first is, you know, it's really not appropriate because, as I just said, you may need different doses. That is extremely likely. And we don't have the safety information on the younger age groups. And until we get those um, squared away and we understand both proper dosing for, for younger children and um, the safety profile of the vaccine, as well as its efficacy profile, I, it would not really be appropriate to, to expose children to the vaccine. The second issue is, unlike most drugs that can be used freely off-label by clinicians, th this vaccine is being distributed by uh, the US government through the CDC, and there's a provider agreement in place and under that provider agreement, there are certain protections, uh, you know, liability and so forth that adhere to that. If you uh, deviate uh, from that, then these things may not be the case, even um, compensation potentially for uh, someone who suffers an adverse event. So I would refer people to the CDC uh, for further information on that. But those are additional considerations. This isn't just like a drug that's yeah. available uh, for uh, use out, you know, in the public. Right. But Dr. Woodcock, I'm going to go back to it. Everybody wants to know. Parents want to know. School districts want to know. Dr. Fauci has said he expects there to be vaccination of kids under 12, perhaps by the end of the year, early winter. Do you think that's realistic? I would certainly hope so but it depends on you know, the trials getting done, that the results are favorable, that we feel comfortable, everyone feels comfortable, that, don't, that new safety questions do not arise, that the companies are able to manufacture the dosage forms and have them available uh, and so forth. But everyone is trying their best because we understand the urgency of uh, getting children under 12 vaccinated if that actually is feasible. And it's been publicly announced by the manufacturers, and, and you referenced it in a media call on the BLA, that the trials are still being conducted. Isn't that correct, as you just point out? So we still need to get those trials done. In case. Correct. The trials have to be done. There is some safety follow-up. Some trials are still inoculating children, so they're in different phases, and they need to be completed. And we really need that information before we start um, exposing children to these vaccines. I wanna talk a little bit about treatment. You headed up Operation Warp Speed, great success on vaccines. In terms of therapeutics, it's been a little bit mixed in terms of convalescent plasma, remdesivir, but monoclonal antibodies has been a success story, hasn't it? Are there other success stories in terms of therapeutics treatments for those persons who still get COVID? 
the early uh, treatment with monoclonal antibodies is very protective of progression of disease. And in the vast majority of people, uh, you could prevent progression to hospitalization and even death uh, by getting early treatment with a monoclonal. The problem is, of course, the administration of that is difficult and it isn't uh, always a standard practice everywhere. Utilization of them has picked up quite a bit though. And I think that's uh, decreasing hospitalization. And when we developed the monoclonals, we specifically had in mind the idea that even once an effective vaccine was available, certain immunocompromised people may not respond to the vaccine and we will still help people getting sick. And so the monoclonal antibody treatments if used early are effective. Let's acknowledge the elephant in the room, ivermectin. I mean, you know this data, but I want to share with our audience, 88,000 prescriptions a week, normal is 3,600 a week, a 2,400% increase in five times the number of calls to poison centers. We'll put up on screen, the FDA put out a creative social media post, not typical, reminding people that they're not a horse, not something we typically see from <laughs> FDA. Here's your opportunity to talk to the public, to talk to doctors, because let's be honest, some doctors, many doctors are prescribing ivermectin uh, to their patients. What about people that say to you, what's the harm, Dr. Woodcock? Why can't they just try it? What's your message to them? There are not data that show that ivermectin is effective. And there are data, there's a rather large trial done in South America that really doesn't show an effect of ivermectin on the progression of the disease. In terms of physicians, do, do you have a message specifically to those prescribers who are thinking, well, well what's, what's the harm? There, there's the opportunity cost as well, correct? That's and, right. That's take, right. That doesn't work where they could have been taking something that actually is effective. So I, I simply believe ivermectin should not be prescribed either to outpatients or inpatients outside of a, uh, use in a trial setting, period. Dr. Woodcock, one of the questions that we're getting asked a lot is around boosters. Let's talk about boosters for the general population, not those folks that are immunocompromised that we've already talked about, the data uh, that supports its use in boosters. Now, some people are suggesting that the FDA is getting ahead of the science. And the White House had announced that we're going to be giving boosters in late September. You and Dr. Walensky were, were part of this press release. And, and then there's the line that you know, it still has to go through the FDA and the CDC, ACIP, et cetera. But you all are the chiefs of those agencies. So what's your message to those folks that are saying, although it might be well-intentioned, people are getting ahead of the science. We haven't looked clearly enough at the data and there's confusion. Is it eight months? Is it six months? Were you right at eight months or are you right at, at six months? You know, I want to ask, can, can you see that frustration that even some scientific experts are having? How do you address that in terms of it, it's a few weeks away from when uh, the White House has said we're, we're going to start boosters for the general population? Yes. Well, I think in a crisis, it is very difficult and everyone sort of needs to um, uh, calm down and look at, you know, look at the facts. The facts are, it looks as if there is immunity from uh, the current regimen of vaccines that we have in the United States. Immunity is waning over time. And we are seeing breakthrough infections. That's not a secret. We don't need, you know, data. <laughs> um, we need data, but for the general public, uh, it's obvious that there are people acquiring infections who have been fully vaccinated, and there are a few people who are getting uh, to need hospitalization who have been fully vaccinated. Now, even um, right after vaccination, the vaccine doesn't work in everyone, right? And some people don't respond and still get ill. It's not 100% effective. So, so 
So why did why would you announce this? Well, we need to have a plan, uh, and the plan um, would involve uh, the vaccination of very large numbers of people in the United States with a booster dose, right? Um, and we have to make a plan somewhat before uh, we have all the data. And I think that, John, is what's confusing people. Um, if we it sounds waited- like it's done, but to, but to be fair, Dr. Woodcock, it, it sounds like it's a done deal. And some experts will argue, well, what's the purpose of vaccination, which is a great conversation. The, the story is a success story. It's preventing people from dying and, and getting into the hospital. That's the goal of the vaccines. These aren't sterilizing vaccines that are going to eliminate, you know, every type of infection. And if, you know, we allow the fact that people are going to get mild to moderate, and, and be okay. The trends that we're seeing in uh, resistance to the virus in fully immunized people um, lend us to believe that at some point we're going to cross that threshold and we're going to see hospitalizations and more serious disease. And when that happens, we want to be ready. If it doesn't happen, fine, right? But when it happens, we don't want to have a couple more months where we have to get ready and make a plan and then execute against the plan. So um, it is true, we don't have all the data. We have a lot of data on waning uh, from uh, both this country and other countries and the effects on waning, but we don't have all the data on the boost, uh, all the safety data and so forth. Those uh, studies, uh, have been completed and should be uh, available to the FDA soon. But I will say to you, uh, you could talk to me in two months, and if a plan hadn't been made, you would be saying, well, why was there no plan, contingency plan, if in fact uh, the vaccine uh, efficacy waned to the point where we were seeing a lot of hospitalizations and yet we were not ready? All right. Well, I might call you in two months, but, but I want to ask you, what do you think things are going to look like in six months? And you and I have been talking throughout the pandemic, and I appreciate you giving us the time to help educate the public. And, you know, there's been some brighter spots than may look like right now. Yeah. Um, and, and most folks are, are, are curious, what do you think the spring is going to look like or, or late winter? What, and I know you're, you don't have magic crystal ball. What's your best guess, Dr. Woodcock? We don't know what's going to happen. Our best case that we hope, okay, is that um, we will get more of our population vaccinated. We will uh, reduce the spread of this virus. We can move back to an ordinary way of managing it, which would be uh, contact tracing, uh, isolation of infected people and so forth. And we could get back to normal in our society. But it's also possible we may see additional uh, resistant variants that have other characteristics. We hope we won't see any that really elude um, uh, protection from the vaccines, but we have to think that could happen and plan for it. Um, and, uh, you know, there are other possibilities in between those scenarios. So I think with a with pandemic, you have to think about scenario planning, not this is what's going to happen in six months, because we don't know. Dr. Woodcock, I want to thank you for taking the time again today. I want to thank you for all that you and your colleagues have been doing around the clock for more than 18 months uh, to protect the American public. Well, we will continue doing everything we can to, to uh to get both vaccines and therapeutics and diagnostics out there uh, to help combat this threat to our very society. So thank you very much.